Krista Pike was the youngest woman to receive the death penalty at age 18 in 1995. Now, nearly 30 years later, she is pleading for her life to be spared. On January 13, 1995, Pike, along with two others, lured 19-year-old Colleen Slemmer to a secluded area of the University of Tennessee's Knoxville campus. Slemmer was beaten and tortured. They cut her with a box cutter and carved a pentagram into her chest. Pike struck Slemmer in the head with a piece of asphalt and kept a piece of her skull as a souvenir. Pike was sentenced to death and became the youngest woman on death row. Lawyers for Pike filed a motion on Wednesday asking the court to reconsider her death sentence, citing a 2022 state Supreme Court decision that said mandatory life sentences for juveniles and homicide cases are unconstitutional. Slemmer's mother is fighting to make sure that that doesn't happen. Now I'm fighting for justice. I want her either executed where she never can hurt another person or be alive and get things that she's not supposed to get. I want justice. I want Colleen to be, you know, have justice for her. I think if she was out with general population, I think she would try to kill somebody else. I also think that she was a danger to me because she gets out, she can come after us. You know, honestly, I didn't before, but I do now because the way the, the state legislature has changed the rules on death penalty. Yes, I do. Wow. They'll say she's time served. She terms, you know, she served 28 years. So, yeah, I do. Being Colleen's voice and letting people know and the court system know that what they did and how to get this stopped instead of letting us suffer as parents. You know, they need to end this. This has dragged on long enough. Why she sat in and got her nails, her hair done. She makes phone calls. She's tried to escape. And has angels all over in her room. She has a life. She's not just on death row. I don't have support for justice. Um, I've been fighting this alone. Tennessee has not even tried to offer or have help out there, have anyone talk to me at all. I haven't had any kind of a voice. I've been fighting and fighting. It's been 28 years. First thing was the hardest, the very, very hardest is when I had to be in the courtroom and see my daughter's skull and her body parts and clues passed around in front of me. That was really hard to take. Because they had took their time showing it from juror to juror. Could not say anything, could get emotional, could cry, couldn't do nothing. I was told before I went into the courtroom, there's no emotions, no outbursts where I'd be kicked out. I wasn't near it. Um, they were right in front of me. I couldn't touch them. I wasn't allowed to have them. Wasn't allowed to have anything. And it took 16 years to get the skull back. The clothes, I think, were, I don't know. I don't know where they are. I have no idea. She has clothes, brand new coat, sneakers, pants that they, you know, cut up. I have no idea where all that is. And I imagine the medical summer had taken all that. I kept fighting and writing letters and going into Tennessee often. Probably every couple of years, I was just flying out there, talking and making a meeting. And every time they had an appeal, I would get to call the judge and the lawyers. I constantly called. Randy um, Knotts was there at the time. No, I know it wasn't Randy or it was Knotts. And then um, there's um, Joe Helms and Bill Crabtree were there. I fought with them, but they said they could not do anything. It was all in the court. After 16 years of them having it, Patricia Springer, the writer of the book, went into the courtroom, and I guess in the evidence room, they didn't have it locked up. She pretends she was me and said she wants to hold the skull to see what it feels like. Anybody could have went in the evidence room. And that, to me, was not right. And I fought. And after two years, they finally locked it. Um, and nobody could get to it. It was a hard journey. Um, what they did was, after so many letters and so many meetings and stuff, the judge, I wrote a letter pleading to the judge, please let me have it back. And it took two years and I got it back. And then it was like 16 years total, you know, that they had her. I didn't get to hold it. 
It was in a box with pe- stuff with peanuts. It was not in, I could not hold it. Um, we, they handed it to us, me and the victim, after she was me, stood in front of the judge, the Rubits, and she would have, take out every piece of the box and count them. And then put them down and say, marked A, Mark B, C, all the way up. And counted them. But Krista was there in the courtroom, and she said, can I leave? I can't look at this. And they let her leave. They stopped the proceeding, and she was able to leave. A lot. Oh. An awful lot. Um, her, the pieces they took out of her head, um, where the fragment was, her head kind of like crumbled over the years and stuff. And when we put her on the airplane, I had to have FBI agents to take me through there. And and I had to have um, the airport security or whoever they were to take. I had six people guarding me with this because you can't put it through um, the airport through the scanners or anything. So uh, what we did was they put it in a brown box where she was and just put another box. So uh, as we were driving home, it just kept falling apart and falling apart. And there's pieces everywhere. We took them, to, and my, my state took them and cremated them for me for nothing. And we put them in, back in with her urn. Okay. Because if they to Tennessee would mail you body parts, not tell you what it was, Nothing. We got her genitals, we got her outer layer skin, we got part of her nose, all in a box, three different times. And they don't tell you, you just get the box. They did, they did me wrong. You know, the, the, the state doesn't care for victims. They're there to help the criminals. No, it wasn't allowed to. At that time, they didn't have it. No, nobody's heard my voice. Nobody even had taken the steps to say, hey, we can do this for you. We, you can do this and do that. Nobody. They don't, they have forgotten about Colleen. Everybody's forgotten about Colleen. It's gone. You know, it's all about Chris. It's nothing to do with how Colleen or what Colleen went through. And she went through hell. You know, she was tortured for 45 minutes back and forth, racing, getting up, trying to fight. She kept telling her, I'll let me go back to Florida. I will not tell anybody. They knock, knock her down and cut her again. She has a compassion, helping people, feeding people. She always fed the children that was handicapped. And like I said, she worked for the, you know, Clay County Schools doing the paintings and stuff. She did all the you know. When you're out of school and you graduate, you can't work for the school system. I'm painting the rooms for a summer job. That was her summer job, painting the rooms and stuff. Mm-hmm. So then she went to Wendy's, and the Wendy's is still there where she worked at. I will feel like she would be complete, but I also will feel like it ain't over with until Chris is not alive yet. I want her dead. I want her breathing in another air. If they get the piece back to me, they don't have any evidence to hold her other than just the court hearings and stuff like that. Even though she admitted it and showed them where it was and danced at Colleen's uh, site that they killed her at, she went up um, 30 minutes, 40 minutes later and was dancing around the uh, body, the area where, you know, in the park where she did it and kept giggling with the police and said, do you know who did this and all that? And that's how they got it real, basically. Uh, she was. She went up to a couple cops and kept saying, "Oh, who did that? Who's that?" And oh, they must have did a good job. And it was. It was crazy. Yes. <laughs> when they set the date to fight this appeal, I'm going to be there no matter what. 